Well, good morning, my dear brothers and sisters from the Presbyterian Free Church of Livonia. I welcome you yet again to, to my home. Uh, I'm recording from my home today. Even the sermon will be recorded from home. The Bible study will also be recorded from home. Uh, my wife arrived. God, thanks be to God. My wife arrived from Korea and my whole family is not together. Uh, but that naturally brings additional concerns. Since... Uh, they came from Korea, took an airplane, you know. So there are some concerns that uh, we we may or may not. We may have we may have the virus. Nobody have any symptom whatsoever. We are perfectly healthy, but we, we cannot know for sure. So we thought it best not to be in contact even with the soma family at church. So I'm doing the recording 100% from my home. On this day, I'm recording on Saturday, and I hope you'll be watching tomorrow on April 5th on the Lord's Day. Uh, so, first of all, may you have a wonderful Lord's Day, and may the Lord speak to you profoundly uh, right now on this sermon. It will not be an entire service that will be recorded. Of course, you guys know biblical theology. A service cannot be done, a public service cannot be held by one person alone. Uh, a sermon can be done, can be recorded. I'm, I'm about to do one. But in a public gathering, a public worship, it's when two or more people gather together. Otherwise it's not. Otherwise it's not. Otherwise it's private worship. So I have a, I have a sermon that will be recorded in a few minutes and I hope you guys will be thoroughly blessed at home. It is uh, a benefit that we have, that technology affords us, but this will never replace the gathering of God's people. I think it's in the, in the book of Hebrews that we should not give up meeting together as some are, are in habit of doing. But let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. So the, the, the writer of Hebrews tells us, do not give up meeting together. We must never give up meeting together. But as we are in these days, in this situation these days, let us for now, use the benefit that technology gives us i will pray let us pray and let us i will do the usual prayer the prayer uh, similar to what i do at church uh, i'll bring a few matters to our attention during the prayer we'll pray for them we we'll ask god's blessing for them on these matters uh, and then we shall begin the sermon let us pray blessed be your name lord god almighty for we can come before you at this moment we can come together virtually until the day that we can physically come together in your presence on the Lord's Day in a place of worship. Oh Lord, but for now we acknowledge that you are kind. We acknowledge that you are good. We acknowledge that you are wonderful. That there is no other God besides you. That there is no one in heaven on earth who is good, who is as good as you are or as kind as you are, or as powerful as you are, or as merciful as you are. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, what a delight we have to be speaking to, to the entire Godhead, to the whole Trinity at this moment. Bless us, O Lord. I will pray for your many blessings upon your people. And the most important of them is for the forgiveness of sins. Oh Lord, forgive us our sins and trespasses. As we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Oh Lord, assist us in walk assist us in walking in forgiveness so that we may forgive all who hurt us, who do wrongly with us. And Lord, may we thoroughly enjoy your forgiveness as you have promised to us that comes through the blood of Christ through the complete sacrifice of the life and death of Christ. Oh Lord, we pray for our church that you may bless us, that our church may, may grow in quality, in quantity, in its finances, in its influence on our neighborhood, city, around the world. Bless us, O oh Lord, that we may be, so that we may be, even better than we are now. Oh Lord, we pray for all the members of our church, all the families there represented, that we may be safe 
from this virus, that we may be protected, but Lord, that we may be a blessing to all at this time as well. Oh Lord, we are not gathering together because we believe that this is for, for now the best way to show Christian love to our own people and to the community at large. Oh Lord, if you if you have in store something more specific for us, oh Lord, reveal to us on an individual level or on a congregational level. Lord, we do not want to, to pass through this moment of trial and difficulty as if nothing is happening, completely oblivious to the needs of the world. Help us, O oh Lord. Teach us, guide your people. O oh Lord, we continue praying for the seminaries that are connected to our church. Pray for the seminaries in Grand Rapids, in Edinburgh, in South Africa. May your many blessings be upon them. And Lord, at this moment, as we are about to listen to the preaching of your word, as we are about to look at Genesis 25, bless us, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at home, I ask you to please open your Bibles on Genesis chapter 25. That, that would be necessary that we go to Genesis chapter 25. I'll read verse 1 until verse 18. Um, I would not be able to finish the entire uh, section of Pericopi, as you guys may remember. I will not be able to finish this entire Pericopi. Uh, which goes from verse 1 until verse 18. I will not be able to go through the entire uh, section. However, I intend to be able to finish verses 1 to 6. Uh, when I was preparing the sermon today, lo and behold, yet again, I thought I was concerned that uh, I would go through the entire pericope too quickly. But when I sat down and I put everything on paper, lo and behold, I will need more than one sermon. You guys may be tired of listening to this, but I'm not lying. It is true. So let us begin. Genesis chapter 25. I'll read verses 1 until verse 18. But today's goal, my goal is to go from verse 1 until verse 6. Um, the title of today's sermon is Abraham's death and the endurance of faith. I'll say it yet again. Abraham's death and the endurance of faith. This will be part one. Let us begin as Abraham, um, Genesis chapter 25, verse 1 to verse 18. And so it says the word of the Lord. Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan begot Sheba and Dedan. And the sons of Dedan were Ashurim, Latushim, and Leomin. And the sons of Midian were Epha, Epher. Hanok, Abida, and Elda. All these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward, away from Isaac his son, to the country of the east. This is the sum of the years of Abraham's life which he lived, 175 years. And then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age an old man and full of years and was gathered to his people and his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah which is before Mamre in the field of Ephraim the son of Zohar the Hittite the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth there Abraham was buried and Sarah his wife and he came to pass after the death of Abraham, that God blessed his son Isaac. And Isaac dwelt at Beer Lahai Roi. Now this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maid servant, bore to Abraham. And these were the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebaioth, then, Ken, then Kedor, Adiel, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadar, Tema, Jetur, Nafesh, and Kadema. These were the sons of Ishmael, and these were their names by their towns and their settlements, twelve princes according to their nations. These were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137. 
and he breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which, which is east of Egypt as you go toward Assyria. He died in the presence of all his brethren. So far the reading of the word of the Lord. May the Lord bless us as we look at this uh, blessed and inspired holy scripture. I have a question for you. Have, have you seen people that have exercised a multi-generational impact? People whose life legacy went way longer than their death, than the, the date of their deaths. Ha, have you heard of such? Have you heard of families? Have you heard of families that exercised multi-generational impacts? Families that they were not just a family, they, they, they were a dynasty. Have you heard of the dynasties? Have you ever heard of the Romanovs in Russia? Have you ever heard of the Rothschild? believing in, in Europe. Have you ever heard of these names? These are families that lasted le generation after generation and their impact are very difficult or perhaps impossible to be measured. What's the secret? I'll give you another other names. First and most important of all, and the undoubted, unchallenged, top of the list was the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But of course, he's God himself. He was thoroughly filled with the Holy Spirit. So of course, his impact would last forever. But we have all the names of people that were not God themselves. There's only one Jesus. But what are the other names? You take, for example, Muhammad. His impact is lasting until today. No, there's no doubt about that. Oh, you take another one, Siddhartha Gautama, the, the one called the Buddha. His impact is clearly seen today. Confucius, Mao Zedong, Stalin. The, the, the impact that these people's lives, their legacy, endures until today. I'm not saying that those were good things or bad things. Most of them, for me, in my opinion, and I'm ready to defend this, were very negative. However, however, their impact is still seen until today. Well, how? Another one, and the one that is most connected to today's message, Abraham. Abraham is a predominant figure in the three largest mono monotheist religions in the planet. Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Abraham is a major figure in all these three religions. What did he do? What did he have? What caused him to have such an impact? That man shaped the world. No questions about it. No questions. The entire Christian world knows his name. The entire Muslim world knows his name. The entire Jewish world knows his name. What, is so, what was so special on Abraham's life that that made him so famous. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 22 says that a good man lives an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Now, if this is true, and I believe it is, I affirm it is, if this is true and important, then it goes for finances, then it goes double for a spiritual legacy. If it's important to leave some sort of financial legacy to your children, and Proverbs 13 states so, then for sure, this is far more important when it comes to a spiritual legacy. Far more important. Now, let me tell you this. If you are a Christian, if you're born again, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you believe in the Bible as the completely inspired word of Christ, I affirm to you, death for you can only be the, the, the change of, 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 circumstantial, of, circumstan of circumstances, of, of, of planes of reality. It can, death can only be the date that you set, okay, from, the, from this day on, he shall no longer act. 
not a legacy, but your first-hand actions. If you are a Christian, your belief ought to be that your first-hand actions will last until the day you breathe your last, not your impact, not your words. The Bible speaks of people that were dead and yet are speaking. How? How are they doing such? How are they achieving such fantastic goal? How can they do that? How did Abraham do this? Uh, I'll give you two examples of people that left an incredible impact in recent history. First of and I have mentioned this before on sermons at our church. First of them is Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards' legacy includes one United Vice President of the United States, one Dean of a law school, one Dean of a medical school, three U.S. Senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 13 judges, no, 30, 30 judges, 60 doctors, 65 professors, 75 military officers, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, 100 clergymen, and 285 college graduates. Wow. Now, Max Jukes. Here's what, his, he, here's what you can find on his genealogy, on his descendants. Seven murderers, 60 thieves, 109 prostitutes, 150 other convicts, 310 paupers, and 44, no, 440 who were physically wrecked by addiction to, by addiction to alcohol. Of the 1,200 descendants that were studied, 300 died prematurely. Light in day. Day in... Forgive me, day and night, light and darkness, completely different, worlds apart, east and west. What, how, how can these two men have left such an important, uh, such a great impact and radically different? The answer is the kind of legacy that they have left behind, the kind of legacy that they were able to infuse on their children. Now, we see that Abraham, we see on Genesis 25 that when he came to the end of Abraham's life, we, we ought to look at him. Like I said, if you are a true born again Christian, you ought to believe that the, the final day, that you're the day of your death, it is not the day that your impact ends, it's the day that your first hand actions end. Not the multi generational effort. The multi generational effort continues. And on Genesis 25, we come to see the end of this man's life. Now, let's look at the details here. Before we get, my, my main trust on today will be found on verses 5 and 6. However, I will go through each of the verses to explain all the details so that we, mean, so that we miss nothing. Verse 1, Abraham again took a wife and her name was Keturah. Now, who is this lady? And was it really a wife? Now, if you just read this, I'm reading from the New King James. If you read... If you just read the plain words here, you understand that he got married. See, a wife. However, this translation is somewhat interpreted for us. In Hebrew, what we have here is a laka, I believe laka isha, mean took. Laka is just the, the verb for taking. And isha is the feminine of ish. Ish is man, isha, a woman. So he took a woman. Now, when you, when the, the Bible usually uses this expression to actually say that he married somebody. However, it can also mean that he simply took a woman. And if you read on, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, no, not Corinthians, 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 32, we see that there Keturah is referred as Abraham's concubine, concubine. Here we have the word Isha. In the in First Chronicles, we have the word Peleg, oh, Pele, Peleges. Peleges meaning concubine. 
So indeed, he took another lady to be his, but never married her. And the text itself uh, clarifies this for us. We see that only the children of Sarah, the child of Sarah, which was Ish, which is Isaac, only him. He was the only one that got an inheritance. Why? That's the law of the time. That was the law of the land. The children of the concubines were not entitled to an inheritance. The inheritance would be given solely to the children of the legitimate wives. And he had only one, Sarah. So we see here that Abraham, that Ketur, Abraham did not 100% learn from his mistakes. You remember Hagar? We already studied Hagar. Hagar was a mess, a mess in the life of Abraham. It was not even his idea. We'll, we'll grant him that. But he accepted it. He should have told Sarah, no way, lady. There is not a chance that I'm going to lie down with anybody but you. You are my only wife. But he did. He accepted it. He lay down with Hagar. Ishmael was born. The problems began. And I'm not blaming Ishmael. I'm blaming Abraham. I'm blaming Abraham for not having done what he was supposed to do in the first place. And apparently he did not learn from his mistakes. Now you may be thinking, Philip, wait a minute. You began this sermon by saying that you would tell us how Abraham had a multi-generation impact. And now you're criticizing Abraham. Which is it? The answer is both. The answer is both. Why I'm actually happy to begin with the criticism. Because we and I have made mistakes. So even though you have made mistakes, and most likely plenty, isn't it? Even though you and I have made mistakes, we can look at this text, look at Abraham's life and be confident that God is still on our side. Because look at this, he made a mistake and yet God ensured that his legacy would endure. Now, of course, the legacy that Abraham left was a spiritual legacy, first of all. And second, God blessed him and caused him to leave that wonderful legacy to the further generations. But we'll get to that. We'll get to that in more detail. So let, let me continue. We, before I even go to verse 2, let me give you, let me open a side note. Let me make a side note here. Let's say, for argument's sake, that Keturah was actually his wife. Let's say that he married again. Oh, by the way, a side note within a side note. We are not sure when Abraham took Keturah. Some commentators mentioned that it could be right after Hagar left. It could be, it could be that after Hagar left, a few years later, Sarah also left and then he took Keturah as a, I don't know, so that he wouldn't be alone. I'm not saying I agree. I'm just giving the, the possibility. And biblically speaking, all these options are actually available, are actually able to be held. I cannot prove either of them, but all of them would fit with the narrative. If you take the plain reading of the word, you would imagine that Keturah was taken after Sarah died, after Hagar was far away already. But not always, not always the Bible is, particularly the book of Genesis, not always. We have a, a chronological, a chronological uh, um, description. It first was A and then B and only then C and only then D. No, not necessarily. For example, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. We see that Genesis 1, it's Genesis, forgive me. We see that Genesis 2, it's kind of the, the, the closing in of the lenses on a specific section of Genesis chapter 1. We see that Genesis chapter 1 speaks of the day in which he made men and women, the Adam and Eve. Now we see chapter 2 and a perfect description of that. So challenge uh, chapter 2 is, is found within chapter 1 if you look at the chronology of it. But if you look at the textual description, we see one after the other. But if you were to actually place them in, in, a, in a schedule, in the calendar, you would see that chapter 2 is completely placed within the 
the, the, chron the chronology of chapter 1. So sometimes there is an overlap. Sometimes the Bible advances on the narrative and then opens a window on the past or makes a reference to a point that was found in the past. So that could be. We do not know for sure when he got Keturah. But let's imagine that Keturah was actually a wife, properly taken. After, when I say properly taken, I mean properly married. And he married her after Sarah died. Would that be a problem? Of course not. Of course not. Why am I making such observation? I have heard countless, countless, countless cases of children complaining with the parents when said parents want to marry again after the husband or the wife, the spouse died. I have heard many cases like this. Or I have heard cases of widows that desire to marry again, but don't do so. They feel lonely. They feel sad, they feel scared, they go through financial hardships, but they won't marry again, not because they, they cannot find a guy, but because they are afraid of what the children will say, or because the children already said, I, I, I won't accept, I won't take it if you marry again. That's from the devil. Listen to me, that's from the devil. I'll say it yet again. That's from the devil. The Bible says so. The Bible says that forbidding people to marry legitimately, I repeat, legitimately, is from evil spirits. Those are not, that's not my opinion. That's not my interpretation. It's written just like this in the word of Christ. So there is no problem. There is no violence done to the memory of the deceased if thy spouse decides to marry again. I told my wife, particularly here in my own home, I told my wife, honey, if I die, marry again, please. I don't know if people will marry you. We have four children after all. I'm so sorry, honey. I don't know if they'll marry you, but you have my blessing to marry again. And if you want me to be with you, stay alive. For as long as you're alive, I'm yours. If you die and a good looking lady appears, on the, way, on the funeral, I'll ask her number. I tell this to my wife. You can tell this to your wife as well on a romantic evening. You'll love it. you see, it will be wonderful. Now let us look from verses 2 until verse 4. We see here the list of the children that, are, that came from Keturah. A whole bunch of beautiful names here, we can tell. But out of these children, two of them I want to particularly uh, observe. Jokshan, which we see here, his name is mentioned in verse 2 and repeated in verse 3. Jokshan begot Sheba and Dadan. And also on verse 4, the sons of Midian. Midian was mentioned in verse 2 and is re-mentioned on verse 4. Why? Does it mean that all the others do not have children? Not the case. Does it mean that these were all the children they had? Not the case either. They are, uh, Moses is bringing this genealogy in order to mention those that will be particularly relevant for the telling of the biblical story, for the biblical narrative. And we see that Midian, from where, from whom came the Midianites, the children of Midian. And we see here that uh, Jokshan, the children of Jokshan and the children of Midian, I think on chapter 11, I think on chapter 11 or chapter 10 on the book of Genesis still, mentions that these were, the, these names here actually, they, they developed into tribes that were in the surrounding regions of the promised land. Maybe, maybe not chapter 11, maybe, if, maybe after that. Uh, so we see here that these, these were the important names. I'll give you an example. Moses himself. Moses married Zipporah. Zipporah was the daughter of a priest from Midian. So he was a Midianite. So we see here that these names are the most relevant for the future, for the development of the biblical story. Now we see here 
on verse 5. We come to verse 5 and we see that Abraham left everything for Isaac. Isaac. Why? Standard legal procedure of the time. Nothing, no, nothing out of the ordinary. Somebody, if a passerby or an, a third party would be looking at this story, at that time, he would not find anything irregular. Now, what is irregular? What is irregular? It's not for us. For, for us on this 21st century, it may sound that it's irregular that he gave everything to one person and to the other he gave gifts. But for the people at the time, the irregular thing to be done, done here was the gifts given to the others. So if we are to actually be concerned about Abraham's actions, the concern comes in why the gifts to the others, not in the fact that he gave everything to one son. That was a standard legal, legal procedure of the time. So Abraham did nothing wrong here. In fact, Abraham was considerably generous. And I believe there were two reasons why Abraham was so generous. First of them, he was a kind-hearted man, a man blessed by God. A man, he was quite rich. He was quite rich. Very few people have enough servants to raise an army from the servants in order to fight against four kings. I don't have that kind of money. I'm sure you also don't. Very few people in the planet today may have it. If ever, Abraham had it. Abraham had all this money. So indeed, he was in a position that he could afford to be generous. Now, observe the generosity not necessarily comes from because I have a lot, I can give a lot. Generosity is an action from the heart. Generosity goes beyond the amount of money that I have. Generosity comes from the heart. If you're generous with a little bit, you'll be gener generous with a lot. If you're not generous with a little bit, don't fool yourself. You're not generous in any situation whatsoever. Your, the problem of your heart, the problem is in your heart, not in your wallet. So let us continue. And so Abraham gave the gifts because he was a kind-hearted a kind -hearted man. But I believe there was actually a strategy involved there. Here's this strategy. By giving gifts to the children that would not expect the gift giving, he would be winning. I, I mean this in a good sense. Please don't think that I'm, that I'm attributing to Abraham uh, evil intention. But he would be winning their hearts. They would see, wow, I'm not supposed to get anything. And I'm here getting nice gifts from my father. I'm... Legally speaking, I'm not entitled to anything. And now here's dad giving me all this nice stuff. That's quite nice. Dad is quite kind. So strategically, Abraham was giving these gifts to his children so that they would have a thankful, a, a, a thankful attitude towards him, which would in, in the future relate to his own son. So they would look at Isaac and, and think, wow, that is, the, that is the son of that man that we all know to be so generous. You are far less inclined to attack that kind of boy, that kind of man, kind of person. And that would be very important because all, all Abraham's riches, the thick of his richness would go only to one boy. Only true. And by the way, we read in the life of Isaac that he planted, that he did a lot of, he employed all, most of his, a lot of his efforts in agriculture, and he got 100 by, for one. And the Bible says he became extraordinarily rich. Now, mind you, before the Bible said that, he was already extraordinarily rich. And the Bible said, now, now he became rich. So we can imagine Isaac to be unbelievably rich now that calls attentions right the people that were surrounding him that were not nearly as rich as was could think well he's very rich but we have a lot of numbers let us attack him let's get his money so by doing so Abraham was, was not ensuring but taking one additional step 
in the protection of his son. Why did he do this? Simple. He was ensuring his legacy. Which legacy? The one that God gave him. The, the vision. He was ensuring the perpetuity of the vision that God gave him. What was the vision? From you, Abraham, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. And we know that the blessing came through the Jews. Why? Because the Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, came from the Israelites. That's why. And Jesus himself said, Abraham saw my day. And he was glad. He was glad because he saw I. He saw that I would come. He saw me. He saw that he saw my day. He was made happy because of what he saw. So Abraham, with the eyes of faith, understood what was to happen. And not only because God said, but because God had said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I will send the child of the woman, Eve, and he will crush the head of the serpent. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And the serpent is the enemy of your souls, which is the devil. So, while they were still living, verse 6, and while he was still living, while Abraham was still alive, he sent the children east, eastward, and kept Isaac west. On this case, west meaning West from the stand of view, from the point of view of the one that is writing, of course, which was Moses, and he was writing this when he was in the region. Of course, he was referring to Canaan. So we see that Abraham understood that in Isaac, the the vision, the, the legacy, the promise that God made to him would have to continue through Isaac. God told Abraham, Abraham, here's what you're gonna do. You're going to leave your parents, your, your, well, your relatives. You're going to leave your home. You're going to leave your land. You're going to go away. You don't know yet the location. I will show you. I will show you the land that you're going to go. And through you, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. Now, the first thing that God demanded from Abraham was separation. Go. Do not be with your relatives. Do not be on the land that you grew up. Do not be among those of your household. From you, a new family will be born. So God was giving him a progression. First, I make a family out of you. Abraham, first, a separation is necessary. After the separation takes place, a family will be developed, which will come in Isaac. And only then, with the passing of years, I'll make a blessing. I'll be a, a, from you, a blessing will come to all the families of the earth. So from your family, Abraham, all the other families are blessed. Abraham needed to develop a family. Oh, but all his children were his family. Yes, indeed, on today's standards. But God told him, in Isaac, your family will be known. In your, in Isaac, your seed will will be called. That's the progeny that I'm choosing. So Abraham had a logical, Abraham came to a logical conclusion. That, guys, I'm not saying that you need to be a man of God to notice this. This is pure logic. What God told Abraham, Abraham, I need separation. The family will be developed apart from the others so that you are not contaminated, not racially speaking, but by the spirituality of the people around you, by the faith of the people around you, that are not necessarily, at all actually, the faith that I'm about to give you. I'm going to reveal to you, Abraham, the most fantastic thing in the universe. Abraham, to you, I'm going to reveal myself. That's what God said. So I need separation. You cannot be with the others. Because what you're going to have is remarkably different than all the others. The others may know me, indeed, to a certain extent, but I'm going to reveal to you specifically how I am, who I am, and what I demand from you. You cannot be with the others. We call this concept holiness, to be set apart, to be different, to be 
separated for a specific purpose. God was telling Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to do that to you. Well, now God also revealed Isaac through your son, Isaac, not, not the other, not Ishmael, not any other, Isaac only. God said, I'm going to bless Ishmael. I'm going to do this, 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 this. But your legacy will go through Isaac. So Abraham came to the obvious, most obvious and most logical conclusion. Well, God took me away from my relatives. He wanted my separation. He wanted the development of a family to come through me. Then he tells me that this is through Isaac. Then the logical conclusion is that Isaac has to be separated as well. Our own, our own family needs to grow. Oh, but the others are my family, but God said it's only for Isaac. So he needs to be separated just like I am. So in the case of Abraham, God said, I'm going to separate you. And it's going to be in a different land. But Isaac was already in the different land. Isaac was already in the promised land. So Isaac did not have to leave like Abraham. What to do then? Well, if Isaac does not have to leave because he's already on the proper location, then those who are also there, they will have to leave. So Abraham sent them away. You may read this and think, Felipe, it still feels like, it still feels like Abraham was way too tough. Doesn't sound good to me. Let me tell you this. It didn't sound good to Abraham either. He didn't like it either. Remember when Sarah had that very, very ungodly behavior? Instead of admitting that she made a mistake, she actually blamed everything on Hagar and Ishmael. Poor Ishmael was just a child. Poor Ishmael. And God said, Abraham, you actually have to send them away. Abraham and Isaac, your descendant will be called, your descendants, your, your legacy will be found in Isaac, not in the others, in Isaac. The Bible says that Abraham thought the matter was very displeasing. That's the word used. That's the expression. Very displeasing. Abraham did not like one bit. Put yourself in his shoes. Would you like to send your biological son away? Abraham had to send all his biological sons away apart from Isaac. He didn't like it either. In my opinion, he should not have either, even related to Keturah. Keturah should have been just a friend. Hi, hi, bye, bye. See you later. God bless you. Bye. That's, that's it. And he knew. God told him, in Isaac, in Isaac, your descendant, your seed, your legacy will be found. Isaac, not in any other. But nevertheless, Abraham related to Keturah. But look at the actions of Abraham. Abraham, when, sent, when he sent his children away, he was not being bad. He was not doing according to the evil of his heart. He was ensuring the legacy. He was ensuring that God's vision, that the vision that God gave him, the formation of a new family, the formation of a new people that would be used to bless the entire world. God was assuring that that legacy, God, Abraham was assuring that that legacy would continue. Abraham saw that the impact of God's vision should last for multiple generations. Yes, he saw that. He understood that by faith. Christians, you and I, our legacy ought to continue for many generations, just like Abraham. Today we are living the blessing of Abraham's faith. May your children live, live the blessing of your faith, and may your faith be that of Abraham. May your faith be just like that of Abraham. Galatians, I think, chapter 3, verse 27 or 29, says that those of faith are those not of the, biology, of the biology of Abraham, but of the faith of Abraham. I couldn't care less about your biology. Man, woman, whatever nation you come from, 
whatever preference you have in terms of language, culture, that's not my case. That I, I couldn't I couldn't care less about that. But I want you to as a Christian, as a Christian, you must ensure the perpetuity of your legacy. The day you die, you must ensure that your children, if you have biological children, great, they are the most important ones in this case. If you have not, those whom you call, those whom you would call children, not biologically, but by influence. Remember the terms mother and father and children in the Bible go beyond the biological boundaries. John, when he wrote, I think, uh, I think first John, he says, my little children, my little, he did it. He was not writing to his biological children. He said, those whom I taught in the faith, those whom I, call, I was used by God to see their new birth. Those who came to Christ through my ministry, through my speech, through my influence. You must continue my legacy. So that's what Abraham was doing. He was assuring that by putting the children away, that that family would be made. Now, let me tell this. If you are still thinking that Abraham lacked love, you are wrong. Let me tell you why you are wrong yet again. And I'm going to give you another argument. Another argument. Let's say you want to build a house. You buy land. Buy a spot of land. And you want to build that house for the people on that land. Let's say you buy, you buy a land where people have illegally invaded. And you have mercy on them. You're a kind-hearted man. You've got plenty of money. And God changed your heart. God taught you that the true Christian life is a life lived in repentance. The penance that goes for as long as we're alive. Just like the Apostle Paul said. Those who used to steal, don't steal anymore. But now work and help the others. A life of penance. That, that's Christian living. Let's say you, you, you want to exercise that. And you come to a land where a lot of people invaded. And you tell them, I want to make a home for you. There. I want to make a gorgeous home for you. I want to be beautiful. Never seen anything like that. What do you do? You buy the land. Let's say you already own the land. They invaded your property. What do you do for them? How do you build the house? Do you build the house of them there? You don't. You don't build the house of them there. You tell them, you go away from that location. I'm going to bring all the tractors, big cars, the machinery, I'm going to make a massive house. After the house is done, I bring you back. So you do kick them out, so that you may build a home, so that they may return. Are you being evil? Oh, you bad man. You're kicking them away. You're sending them away. Are you evil? No. No. To build something. There are demands for building things. Try, try making an omelette without cracking a few eggs. Try it. You're not going to have any success. Abraham was cracking the eggs here. Abraham sent them so that they may come back. I'll say this again. Abraham was not sending them so that they may stay away. Uh -uh. Abraham sent them so that they would have a home to return to. Just like the, the, the story that I told. You send the people away, build the home, and they come back when the home is built. Who lives in the construction site? That's not a place to live. Well, during the day, sure. The place is beaming with people. The place is full of people. Machinery and noise and activity and money and supplies and... And everything. Go to a construction site at night. The place is dead. Nobody's there. The place is horrible. No, people are not there. And they cannot be there. That's what Abraham was doing. Abraham was saying, children, you need to go. You need to have your own families. God said that my family will be through, through Isaac. And children, I love you. You've got to believe this, children. God, if, if you don't go, this family will not be formed as God wants it. And if this family is not formed as God wants it, which family will bless yours? Because God said, through you, Abraham, through Isaac, eventually, 
All the families of the earth will be blessed. So my children, you got to go. You got to go. You got to start your own families so that the family of Isaac may bless yours. Philip, you're making this up. Abraham didn't see this. Of course he did. Jesus said, Abraham saw my day. Abraham saw that Christ was coming. And on the coming of Christ, all would come to him. Tell more. Solomon saw that. When Solomon was praying, when Solomon built the temple, here's what Solomon said. Moreover, concerning a foreigner who is not of your people Israel, but has come from a far country, far, far country, huh? and Abraham sent them eastward. For your name's sake, for they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your outstretched arm. You see this? They would go and they, and Solomon is saying, they will hear the people from far away. They will hear of God's name. When he comes, when, they, when the people, when the foreigner come back and they pray towards this temple. And he says, God, here in heaven, in your dwelling place. And do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you. That all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you. Abraham sent the children away. So that in Israel, a people could be formed. A God could be revealed. The faith could be preserved. So they would have a home to come back to. Abraham was building the home. Abraham was building the family. Abraham was ensuring the blessing, not only of Isaac, uh -uh, of all the children. Now, if you still think, if you are so empty of faith, that you still think Abraham, was not ensuring his legacy. I'll prove it to you with one more argument. With one more argument. You should have been thoroughly convinced by now. But if you need one more argument, I'll give it on to you. Isaac. No, forgive me. The prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah assured. I'm going to bring the sermon to its end with this final argument. Isaiah chapter 60. Verse 1 to 6. Here's what he said. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. Well, yeah, indeed. The whole world was without the gospel. The gospel was found in Israel only. But the Lord will arise over you. Look at that. And his glory will be seen upon you. The, Gentile, the Gentiles shall come to your light, you see. A people whose light, the people that would have the light, had to be formed so the Gentiles could see the light. If Abraham would not have sent them away, that family would not have been formed and there will be no light. The Gentiles shall come to your light and, ki and kings to the brightness of your rising. Mm. Mm, the kings to the brightness of your rising. Continue, lift up your eyes all around and see they all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar. You see this? You see? Abraham died without listening to this. And yet he believed. And sometimes when I read this, and we don't believe. We don't believe that God is kind. We don't believe that God is good. We don't believe that God wants a vision, a legacy for our families. And you know how we prove that we don't believe? We don't teach our children well. Biological or otherwise. Biological or otherwise. If we actually believed this, our greatest and number one concern was to infuse in the minds of our children, biological or not, our loved ones, biological or not, that this is the most important thing in the universe. I'm always surprised by how parents are so tough with children when it comes to brushing their teeth. And they should. You want to see your children with shining, sparkling, bright, white teeth. You want to see that. You should. Shame on you if you don't. Which one is more important? Your children smile? Or their faith? Or their thoughts? Sorry, the decision is quite easy. And they're so tough of the children when it comes to brushing their teeth. And so they should. But when it comes to 
and learning the Bible, spiritual disciplines, prayer. They're so soft. They're so loose. Moms, call children far away. Are you eating well, my boy? My daughter, are you being safe? What about have you read the Bible today? What is God teaching you these days? Which good book are you reading? Which good endeavor, which good action are you employing in order to make sure that people come to know Christ? Your son shall come from afar and your daughter shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant and your heart shall swell with joy because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. Now it's getting even better. The multitude of camels shall cover your land. The dromedaries, it's just another kind of one, a variation of the camel. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah and those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. Mm. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. Connect the dots with me. Consider. Consider what the Old Testament reveals to us and what we see in the New Testament. The Genesis 25, 25 mentions that Abraham sent his children east, eastward. And we see here that on the book of Matthew, three wise men from the east, notice that, from the east, the same location where Abraham sent his children, that they literally came to see Christ. And as the prophet mentioned, they would bring gold and incense. Correct? They did bring gold. A gift fit for kings. A metal one considered by excellence. One of the most precious metals. Most beautiful. Uh, which, which, which country in the planet does not have a history that includes the desire for gold or the adventure or adventure seeking for gold. Gold is often on the Bible connected with royalty and not only the Bible, in the history of mankind. Gold is usually uh, something that reminds people of great wealth and usually royalty. So we see with the gold, the, associa the association with uh, a kingship. And we see that they also brought incense which is connected to the worship of god which is connected to divine worship which was commonly used on the old testament as um, as an element for the worship of god in the tabernacle in the temple so we see here a king we see here a god now isaiah doesn't mention it but we see that the children of keturah the three wise men from the east, where Abraham sent his children, that they brought, they came to Jerusalem looking for the newborn king so they could worship. Well, we don't worship a king, you worship a God. So they knew that that God would be king and that king would be God. And the Old Testament doesn't mention, but the children of Keturah brought from the east also myrrh which is connected to, uh, which is a, a, an oil, a, a, an oil used, a, an embalming oil used for pre to prepare a body that has died. So they knew that it would be a god, they knew it would be a king, and they knew it would die. Those three gifts were there to represent the kind of baby, the kind of god, and the kind of victim that they had before them. A God that was a king that would die. A king that was a God that would die. Now the children of Keturah have a hope. They continue to have a hope. If you are today a children of Keturah, you have a hope. I have a hope. If I happen to be one of them, if I happen to be on her descendant, on, on descendants, if I happen to be on her genealogy, I'm not sure. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. Then I have a hope. And the hope is in Jesus Christ. The hope is in the God that was king, the king that was God, that died 
for the sins of his people. Abraham saw the day of Christ and he was glad. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Blessed be the name of the Lord who gives us a legacy. O oh Lord, let us imprint your legacy of vision. Let us imprint your message on our own brains first and on the brains of our children, on the minds of our children, so that they may love you, so that they may obey you, worship you, and adore you. Knowing that you are God, knowing that you are King, and knowing that you die, that you did die for all those who call upon you. Blessed be your holy name, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Wish you a blessed Lord's Day. Enjoy this day. This is the day of the Lord. This is the day not for ourselves. This is not your day. This is the day of the Lord. Let us live this day for the glory of the Lord. Let us enjoy. We cannot enjoy public worship on this day, but we can enjoy and should enjoy private worship. May you have a blessed private worship on this blessed day of the Lord. God bless you.